Okay, so I, I guess it's uh, reasonably uh, safe to start. I don't know, maybe we'll give people just one more minute to uh, find the room. Okay, so let's begin. Um, so we've already talked today a little bit about PDF UA, and some of you might have attended that talk and others might not. Um, this talk is much more about the low level of, of tagging PDF and, and why tagged PDF forms the basis of things like PDF UA and content access and reuse and, and such. And, and so um, very briefly, my history with this was um, Back in 1999, I started to um, work with PDF to do content recognition and uh, semantic analysis. And tag PDF uh, became the basis upon which I built all my tools to do this. And uh, before coming to Adobe, I worked for a small company out of Amsterdam who did a document analysis for newspaper companies for basically content reuse, accessibility, resale, uh, extraction. And so nowadays, I represent Adobe. Uh, uh, at, PDF UA, uh, at the PDF UA ISO committee level. Um, but that's my background and why I'm, I'm kind of talking about this. Oops, <laughs> wrong keyboard. So, um, too, many, too many keyboards and mice in front of me. So, first I'm going to introduce the concept of PDF and its rendering model. I talked about this previously a little, but just to recap for anyone who wasn't there, you know, PDF was basically <coughs> based on PostScript. It has a page content model. It has um, a slightly different set of operators than PostScript. We, we rename them. But it's the same fundamental imaging model. Um, and those, the content streams within PDF are comprised of things that paint glyphs and paths and images, et cetera. And these are painted onto a canvas. And by painting them onto this canvas, we produce the appearance that is the final form static rendition of the document. And so the primary purpose of this was around um, print reproduction. It was around exchange on machines and to make sure that the appearance was consistent. And I, I give a very simple example here on the right of a, a, a text stream that prints uh, Hello World, Goodbye Universe. Um, the reality is this is a, it would need a little bit more than this. It would, this is a, a, a very simplified snapshot. But it, it hopefully shows a little bit about the content model of PDF. And when PDF was introduced, um, the big things was, there were a lot of issues with PostScript. Um, not to say that it was a bad language. It had a lot of good properties. But there was a need for encapsulation of documents, a container that wasn't just about a raw content stream, but something that could be distributed and, and, and shared and exchanged. Um, while PDF can rely on external resources, like fonts, for example, there was a, the ability to embed all that rich information into the file so that when it was exchanged, it was it was consistent across all, all devices. Um, and so interchange was really the big factor for PDF. Um, PostScript was too slow. PostScript was a full programming language and allowed you to basically do loops and conditionals and such. And the decision was made to unwrap those loops, uh, 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 un, you know, sort of expand them so that basically PDF is mostly declarative. It's just basically a set of operators that, that cause painting operations. Um, combined into an object package that allows those content streams to be, to be exchanged. One of the important requirements for PDF was that um, with PostScript, you had to run each page in sequence. Each page had to be rendered uh, before you could go to the next page. And basically, it was one long, big blob of content with a series of show pages that basically rendered uh, the graphic stream to a canvas. Uh, with PDF, you don't have to do that. You can jump from page 2 to page 100. And um, because each page is distinct and isolated, um, they can be rendered independently of each other. Um, so it's much more capable for people wanting to interact with these types of documents on a computer. Um, and the design was primarily aimed at fast rendering. Back in 1993, computers were not what they are now. Um, and fast rendering was, was pretty critical. But the times have changed significantly. And, and this was true back in even 1999, to give you an idea. You know, that basically PDF was being displayed on more devices with varying screen sizes. Um, P 
People are already starting to use it to do content extraction, copy and paste, and things like that. Um, accessibility started to become important. And, and that wasn't a fundamental need of the original PDF. And it wasn't something that was ideally suited to in its original form. If you think about simple operations that we perform on PDF today, for example, searching for text within a document, they all rely on actually being able to find Unicode values for those text items or, or some type of recognizable encoding so that I can do a search. And PDF UA is something that builds on all the things I'm going to talk about today to, to, you know, to provide these capabilities. But tag PDF is the heart of PDF UA. In reality, um, when you actually read tag PDF, the ISO standard for PDF is 1,000 pages. The standard for, for PDF UA is about 28 pages, and there's a reason for that. It's all saying, do this thing in tag PDF. <laughs> so it's, it's, it, 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 it simplifies it. Um, so let's talk about some of the problems with traditional PDF and how tagged PDF actually goes about solving some of those. So I'm going to go through a series of problem statements not the solutions. And then I'll go over it again, but this time showing you the solutions to each of these problems. So the first is character understanding. There are many types of fonts that can be embedded in PDF. Um, we subset them for size. And this causes us lots of problems when we actually want to figure out what the text was. For example, you know, here's a show string that has A, B, C, C, D, blah, blah, blah. You know, what does that actually look like when it's rendered? No one in this room, including myself, could tell you because we don't know the context. In fact, in this case, it would render Hello World with the font I've chosen. Um, and so glyph IDs are just indexes into a glyph table. And whatever glyph um, you know, program is there, whatever font program is, is there, will paint something. So if I'm trying to extract this to use in Notepad or TextEdit or Microsoft Word or whatever, what do I extract? Because a human can see that's Hello World. But I'd have to actually do um, recognition on those glyphs to actually understand the contents. Um, and this was achieved by, if, if, you, if you take the mapping, this was the mapping for that font. So that was a subset, and I mapped those glyph indexes to, um, to these things. And of course, you know, uh, it, it, it causes problems when trying to reuse content. Um, content ordering is another big problem. Um, take a simple example. Um, in this case, I rendered the, uh, the black letters separately from the blue letters. I just used offsets to put them in the right places. The final appearance to a human is hello world. But processing that content stream would have HLL, WRLD, and then EOO. And so how do you know the order? How do, uh, how do you deterministically know the order? Um, another example, it was common in the past to do gutter hopping so that printers that couldn't, uh, the certain types of printers would do a better job of aligning lines if you printed one line and the, the second half of it rather than going down one column and then trying to backtrack up and doing the other side. Um, so that content now isn't in reading order. If I just tried to read that content stream, I'd say, this is a page which is for printing across gutters, split into two columns, less common. It, it just doesn't work. So the content streams don't tell me the logical order of this content, um, at least not the way I laid them down. And here I have some paragraphs where the one font, which was the body font, uh, or I should say the paragraph font, was laid out. And then the headings were placed inside um, afterwards because they're in a different font. Again, a common optimization technique, or a perfectly legitimate choice for a processor to create PDF. Um, did I even put spaces into that top content stream? I mean, how do I know where word breaks were, even if I finally figured out an order? Um, and you know, what language is this content? And that's a really great question. It's obviously not in a very good language at the moment. But um, it's, it's very hard to process this meaningfully without better understanding of content. Um, so another example is, oh, sorry, somehow my, my slides got duplicated there. I will jump to the next one. Um, you know, and what constitutes paragraphs in documents? You know, paragraphs are logical con are concepts, um, but they're not something that appear in PDF as, as fundamental uh, things. They are just l layout of text, absolute positioning, and it happens to look like a paragraph to a human reader. Um, all of these are problems. And how do we even identify headings? Do we look for things like font and size changes? Is that reliable? Obviously not. Um, and so basically, um, th that's one of the key problems with PDF is, is you know, the fact that the content is laid out in any order. Now we imagine something more complex like a list or a table. 
So first, let's look at lists. Do I lay them out a line at a time? That's one option. Do I render the bullets first, followed by the text? How am I, as a processor of this document, supposed to recognize that this is a list? And now I go and draw a table. And so you know, I'm just painting these, these cells in a table. But I, PDF doesn't know that this is a table. It sees lines that happen to join together. Um, and then it places some content into that table uh, in a way that supposedly, to me as a human, tells me it's a table. But nothing in the software, nothing in the PDF itself at this point tells me that this is supposed to be represented as a table. I'd have to use heuristics and algorithms to try to determine that. And there are some good techniques for doing this, but they're different for every company and every individual who writes them. Different documents will be correctly or incorrectly recognized. It's non-deterministic, and that's a huge problem for exchange or interchange. Um, you know, you start to look at uh, more complex documents such as newspapers. Um, you know, so so not all the content will, can be in reading order. Um, there's some obvious things like the sidebars and callouts inside of documents. Um, but in newspapers, particularly, there's, there's the concept of uh, article continuations, where a logical article starts on one page and then says, you know, this is on page one, continued on page five. You know, how do I extract that article without all the other text that goes around it? Um, magazines often have uh, center pages that have uh, content that overlap both pages. And, uh, but they're rendered as two individual, they're actually laid out as two pages in PDF. And it just happens that because they're laid next to each other, they form a, so really maybe content starts on one page and flows over onto the next as a, as a kind of a, a layout. And so the order of content as rendered cannot be used uh, to guarantee that you have canonical reading order from that. Um, beyond that, you have things that aren't considered content. You know, you have stuff that isn't really what the author intended for the document. So here we have an example of a pretty complex document with uh, printer's marks and stuff. So we've got some information that tells the printer how to, how to put this and how to align it so that basically it can be printed. But this isn't real content. This isn't something that a reader would want to have. Or if I wanted to extract the content, this would be meaningless to me. Um, but there's more examples. Here I happen to have a header that has an image that's really just a repeat from something on a previous page, a running header. Um, again, you know, I have content that is just descriptive, and it's an artifact of layout. It's an artifact of typography. It's not fundamental PDF content. And I'd really want to ignore it if I was extracting this whole document. I don't want this repeating content to occur every time at the top of each page. It, ma it makes no sense. Um, we have things that segment pages that, again, complete artifacts. They have no meaning except to help the user distinguish between uh, the real content and the, the artifacts. Um, we have backgrounds behind tables that show the tables, but themselves are not semantic or even real content. They're just ways to give a visual indication that there's a table. Tabulated data is different from the layout of that table. Um, and then if we take this paragraph that I've, I've highlighted uh, and expanded, you know. There's, there's several things in this that are artifacts of typography, soft hyphens, because basically we, we try to fit the content into this box. Um, if we look at the, uh, the, the figure at the bottom, we've got a number on the left that is the, the figure number, but it's an artifact. Again, it's not real content. It's just a, a something that's part of the typography process. And on the right hand, another, uh, another, another soft hyphen. So there's, there's lots of problems when you're processing PDF that makes reliable reuse, extraction, accessibility hard. Tagged PDF is the solution to all of these problems. And, and PDF UA mandates PD, tagged PDF's use in a way that ensures reliability. So let's start with the first problem that we talked about, which was character identification. So um, we had that text where the glyph indexes were A's and B's and stuff, but they actually pointed into Hello World. Um, Tag PDF and, and PDF in general, it's not, it, tag PDF just requires that you do this. It's elsewhere in PDF that tells you precisely how to do it. Um, but there's several things you can do. You can use predefined encodings for your fonts, um, for example, WinANSI, MacRoman, and such, that basically tell you that these glyph indexes align with these specific characters. So you're telling a person to consume the font in a specific way. But that doesn't always work, particularly with uh, large Unicode fonts where you're pulling out a selection of glyphs. You really want to compact that into a small table. Um, and so PDF defines what's known as the to Unicode character map. 
And that basically allows you to define the mapping from glyph indexes to Unicode characters. You can define a range of characters to map. Um, you, can, um, map the, you can map those ranges of characters to different areas, so it doesn't have to be one uh, contiguous area. You have the ability to map individual characters. Um, and you can map multiple characters. So just to go back there for a second, here we're mapping certain ranges of the font to certain Unicode ranges and saying, if you process this, if you map it to this equivalent location with this offset, you'll get the right values. In this case, we're mapping a very specific index or a specific uh, character to very specific Unicode um, code points. And in this case, we're actually taking um, perhaps a ligature, something complex, and mapping it out to multiple code points that can be extracted. So for example, you have a single character representing an LI ligature or something, and you want to expand it to L and I when you extract it to a, a non-Unicode compliant uh, you know, text uh, uh, application. Um, and so you need this kind of information to get unambiguous character access. Without this, when you try to extract text from a document, um, you'll get the wrong thing, or you'll have to do clever processing algorithms that you'll get wrong some of the time to do content access. To be clear, the easiest is to use a predefined encoding because everyone understands them. But CMAPs are really common, and they have to be processed to really understand the content of PDF. Um, so the second problem I talked about was um, the, the idea of how do you identify content? How do you segment content? How do you identify order of content? And so basically, Tag PDF gives you the capability of um, logically grouping contents and, and segmenting them so that you can then identify them elsewhere. Um, we have the ability to describe things, and I'll get to a little bit more detail of this in a minute, but um, you can talk about paragraphs and headings and other semantic concepts that are orthogonal to just layout. Um, to segment a page, what you do is you demarcate the content using uh, mark content operators, and you use mark content IDs, MCIDs, um, to give each of those demarcated sequences of content uh, a unique identifier. And so you can see here, I've taken that um, example I used earlier of a begin text sequence, um, and I've broken it up, and I've put demarcated the words. I've done a few other things. I've um, I don't know if the mouse will know. Um, I've added spaces to hello and world because I also have to explicitly disambiguate word breaks. So I've added some spaces. And obviously, um, if I'm, you see, I got rid of the kerning operations because now instead of using a kerning operation to pretend there's a space, there's an explicit space. You can still make this appear identical. Just to be clear, you can use um, small corrections in the, the content stream. You don't have to change the appearance of the content to do this. But you do have to lay it out in this way uh, in the content stream. And so in this case, I've got two uh, things identified as Ps, which are paragraphs. And um, they're explicitly marked as Hello World and Goodbye Universe. The, um, Where's the BT and the ET? I'm sorry. Uh, so the begin text and end text. It's just a content, a content stream uh, a thing that tells you you're talking, uh, 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 starting a, a text sequence okay. in, in PDF syntax. No, no. So, so if you take this top example, yeah. you'll see that there is basically um, a single text sequence with Hello World and Goodbye Universe being rendered. What I've done to segment it is to wrap it in these demarcation operators to give it a unique ID. And in doing so, I can now use that later to refer back to that uh, content. Now, I'll get to how that's used in a minute. Um, one of the requirements is that reading order within a marked content sequence, so when I say a marked content sequence, I'm talking about between these two operators, has to be in reading order, has to be in logical reading order, because there is no way to reorder, there's no way to describe an alternative ordering. So ordering within a marked content sequence has to be logical, but the order in which content is rendered to a page does not. And I'll get in a minute to how that then is, is uh, you know, rationalized into a single reading order. One thing to call out, obviously not all languages use spaces. <laughs> you know, 
the, the, the word break disambiguation is only required for languages that use spaces as, as disambiguation. If you're writing this in Japanese, for example, and you're using a character set that doesn't require spacing, you don't have to put it there. If each, if each character is a word, you've already got a disambiguation. So how do we use this to build this logical order? Well, we use a thing called logical structure. So in the catalog dictionary of a PDF, alongside the pages tree and the outlines tree and all these other good things is the strict tree root. And it's a structure tree that is basically a hierarchy that defines the logical order of the document. And the logical order of a document is defined as a depth first pre-order traversal of that tree. So basically, if I navigate down that tree, iterating across all the nodes, that is the reading order of the content. Um, the hierarchy defines the logical structure, and within it, it describes the semantic properties of the, the content. So uh, just going back to what we talked about previously, paragraphs, headings, lists, uh, tables, and, um, and more. I, I actually have a page in a, in a few slides that actually lists all of the tags. But there's things like article tags, section tags. Um, uh, we, we include rubies and things like that. It, it's a complex set of tags, though it's constrained. And I'll get to how we use that later. And what this does is, this tree is separate from the content streams. It's separate from the pages. It's completely orthogonal, which means it can be completely independent of the order in which content appears in pages. And you, this tree then indexes into those MCIDs on the page to produce the logical structure of the document. And so any node in the document, and I'm just going to peek ahead just to see if I, I actually do have an example that I'll get to in a second. Um, but any. Um, a any node in the tree can point to one or more items of content, as well as having substructure under it to describe the document. And the leaf nodes in the tree point to the content on the page. But for example, taking that the newspaper or magazine example, where content flows over two pages next to each other, and you have a word that maybe splits across those two pages, um, you can start with the content on one page, tell it to continue with the content on the other page, and now you've got a, a reading order that span pages uh, and is what you want. Because the logical reading order of the document, a human being reading that um, visually would see that as one word. And they'd read it in that order. Um, and to make it pr easy to process, these links are bidirectional. So the pages describe which structure elements have content, point to content on them. And the structure tree points into the pages and their content. So if you take um, a, a, a simple document, and I've got an old report that uh, um, I, I wrote with uh, Sheree Ekholm uh, for ISO a, a few years back. Um, on the left-hand side, you're seeing the tag tree. Um, you're seeing sections with a heading level one. Um, under that is a paragraph and another paragraph. Um, although, actually, if I were to re-tag this now with the latest version of Microsoft Word and uh, Adobe products, um, they would actually have things like um, uh, byline and, and such, they'd actually be able to describe that, that this, this uh, committee member thing was actually a, a description of people. Um, you have a heading level one, which is the, uh, the introduction. You have a paragraph. You have another paragraph. You have a, you, so basically, now we're describing this logically. And the reading order is the descent of that tree, not the content order. So if I happen, just for fun, to render this backwards and to put down each word in reverse order, I could still do that and have the logical tree index it in the right order, and it would be good. Type PDF actually tries to dissuade people from doing this. It says that the reading order of the page should be the logical reading order. It makes processing much easier. If you're uh, writing a processor to, to analyze this, it's, it's a lot harder if you have to keep backtracking through a content stream to find MCIDs. But there are times, because of transparency and overlay and interactions, that they have to appear out of order, or for some of the reasons I already described, for example, gutter hopping, um, font selection, and things like that. And so this allows you to have a logical order that's orthogonal to the actual page layout. So the standard structure types. Um, one of the things that was realized was structure is interesting. But it has to be understood to be exchanged. For, for interchange of documents, you have to be able to exchange a known set of tags. And so um, we defined this list of tags. I think this is complete as of PDF 1.7. In PDF 2.0, we are expanding this, actually changing this list slightly um, to be cleaner and, uh, and such. But 
we're retaining this for compatibility, so this is, this is always going to be something you can use. But these are the things that you can use to describe the documents. So you can talk about documents, parts of documents, articles and sections within documents. You can talk about divisions and indexes and tables of content. At, th at the lower level, you've got paragraphs and headings and lists and tables. And when you get down to low level content, you have things like spans and quotes and notes that actually could occur in line in a paragraph if you want to demarcate an individual sequence. I'll show you in a minute how this can be useful. Um, I'm not going to describe all of the tags here. If you want to know more about these, uh, the, they're all documented in the specification. Um, so let's just talk about something like lists. Well, lists are represented. But lists are broken into substructure. Lists have the actual list itself. Within lists, there are list items. Um, within a list item, you can optionally split the content into a label, for example, a bullet or a, uh, a number. Um, and the actual body of the content, which is the actual content for re removing the typography aspect. It's the logical part of the list. Um, in, in unordered lists, it's perfectly correct to mark those bullets as artifacts or to not bother. They are, they're, they're, they're not very meaningful. Um, but if you've got something that has semantics, a numbered list, an ordered list, um, you can basically do that using a, a, a list numbering attributes and such to describe the orders and how they're meaningful. Um, you could imagine that if you're using this for editing purposes, you could actually use that to generate another item in the list. So this has far more use than just, say, accessibility. Um, and basically, a list should contain all its content. The list body should contain all content for each list item so that you can then basically read those, extract those, and do whatever you want with them. Um, and so here's a, a simple um, self-describing list um, that, that uh, uh, discusses the various aspects it, it can have. Um, I also mentioned tables previously at, at, my, at my previous talk. Um, just to break that down a little bit further, a table is represented with the table tag. Um, and underneath that, you have rows. Within rows, you have headings and data cells. And um, you can actually have more complex representations, because if tables have multiple sets of headers or subsets in there, when you get into really complex tables, um, the, the simple a heading with some data cells is not enough to represent them. We have the full ability to say, well, here's a header, here's a body, um, here's, a, here's the footer of the table. Um, and here are headings and cells within those. Um, we also have attributes that allow you to scope things. So for example, headings can be scoped to say, I'm a column header. You know, the things below me um, belong to me, so to speak. Um, or I'm a, a row header, and the things to the right of me um, belong to me. And, and you can have reverse of those and such. And so basically, they allow you to describe uh, tables in, in much more semantically so that as you navigate complex tables and read them, you can do so in a meaningful fashion. Um, and so here's a real example from, uh, uh, I think, my ISO document again, um, where basically I've tagged up um, the caption of a table um, with a, a row with some headings, um, and then the data cells. And I kind of just, just highlight some of the uses. This is not the most complex table, obviously. This is a, a reasonably simple example. Um, there are good examples, and the, the PDF Association has actually done a great job of um, doing uh, what we would call um, sort of well-defined tagged documents. So we took PDF UA, and we took a series of documents, and we said, as a committee, how would we tag these to be perfectly correct? I mean, and there's always some ambiguity. There's always some author choices. It, what does this quite mean? But we have some examples of how to use tagging well. Um, that people can use to think about how they would tag their own documents. Um, this was a, a conference program from 2013 for the, the PDF Association, for, for another PDF technical conference. And you could argue whether or not this is a table, but it's certainly tabular information. And you'll see this starts to use things that actually span columns. So you have uh, you know, the breaks that actually span columns and such. You have uh, titles for each day. Um, you could argue whether this is two tables, the table for Wednesday and the table for Thursday, or a single table with a, a group for Wednesday and a group for Thursday. And I think both would be correct. There is no perfect representation of this table. As long as it's conveyed correctly semantically to the user, as long as the user can tell what things are in the table, that's the important thing. 
Um, and I've already hinted at this, but the logical structure defines the content order. And it overrides the page content order. It can't do that within a marked content sequence. As I say, marked content sequences are kind of atomic. You can't break them down any further. But what it does do is it, it basically says, if you navigate or traverse the tree, you are defining the logical structure in the logical reading order. If you were to extract the content logically, it would have exactly the same order as that tree. Um, and, and I already gave some examples of um, uh, places where this is useful. And again, if you look at something like the PDF association example, you can see how um, you know, content spans. And, and um, this, this document actually was designed to be folded into uh, uh, three pages. And you might imagine, actually, if you'd written this, uh, it had a, had a fold in its brochure. Um, if, you, if you'd printed it in that format instead, if you'd done this as three pages, you might well have used the logical structure to combine those back together. Um, I'll skip past some of those, uh, running out of time. Uh, another aspect of PDF that's really important is the language. And I pointed out this earlier. How do you know what language content is in? And so PDF defines three levels of language within, P within a, a document. There's the document level language, which is usually intended to be the primary language of a document. Um, you might say that this article is entirely in English, with the exception of some content that's maybe in French or German or, or, or some other language. The other levels are structure. So for a given structure element in the tree, you can say its content and all content below it is in a different language. So for example, you might take an art, uh, article that had a whole paragraph in French, and you could put a language on the p tag and say, oh, in this case, I use German, sorry. So <laughs> using the example here, you can say, this entire paragraph is in German, even though the whole document, the, the general language of the document was English. Um, sometimes it's easier to actually just go down to the really low level content and say, this is the language for these few characters within a content stream. And so the third option is to use the, the marked content itself to spe specify language. In this case, we have a span marked content sequence, not to be confused with the structural marked content sequences. You'll notice there's no MCID here. Um, this is specifically a demarcation of content for language. And it can, incur, it can, it can occur inside of a, a marked content sequence with an MCID or around it, but it can't be the same thing. Um, I can explain that further if anyone's really interested. But, but in this case, basically, what we've done is we've got a document that was in English. We maybe had a paragraph that was in German, but we had one sequence which was in Spanish. Um, um, and actually, there's a, there's a typo in my document. This EMC should finish here <laughs> um, because only part of that sentence is only part of that paragraph is in is in Spanish, um, and so that allows you to basically say we have an English document with some sections in in a different language and just these specific characters or words in another language. Another thing I want to talk about a little bit is um, there are three. Beyond language, there are three other attributes or um, properties that you can set, either at the structure level or at the content level. These are known as um, alternate text, alternative text, as I sometimes write it, actual text, and expansion text. And these, anyone who's worked with accessible documents has probably seen these. And they can be a little bit confusing, because they have very subtly different intentions, though they overlap in some ways. Um, Alternative text is just that. It's a descriptive thing that can be used as an alternative when consuming a piece of content. So for example, a figure. You might describe a figure. And um, in doing so, if I'm, a, if I'm blind and I'm using a, some software to read that aloud, you could say a figure of, and then have a description describing that figure. It's obviously not as good as the image. But if you can't consume an image, it's valuable information. Actual text is intended to take content that is intended to be consumed as text, but was represented otherwise. And for those who attended my previous talk, you might recall the drop cap or the uh, ASCII art. Um, this allows you to say that there's an equivalent representation, truly equivalent um, at a textual level to what you saw as a visual representation. And it's this Unicode set of characters. So for example, the NASA logo 
you might want to actually say, well, the, the characters in that are N-A-S-A. -A. And so the actual text for the NASA logo would be, would be that. Expansion text is intended to describe abbreviations. It's very common in languages to have multiple abbreviations that can expand to different words. Take the, the, the letters DR, post, uh, DR period. If that's in an address, it might be drive. If it's in front of a person's name, it might be doctor. You have to have contextual information to know what its expansion is. But if I'm processing a document with a reasonably dumb processor, I don't know that context. You haven't seen any tags here that tell you whether it's a person's name or an address. It's just too complex. And so by having an E attribute, you can tell the processor this expands to this word. So you don't have to change the appearance of the content to tell the processor that this was actually doctor and not drive. It's common to only use one of these on any given structure node. But it's important to say that all three of these can be applicable to a single node. I'm just going to see if I have an example now. NASA is the perfect example of this. Um, if you have the NASA logo, you might have a description of it that says the 1998 logo for NASA, a descriptive property that would be alternative text or, or, or alt. Um, I might have the actual text say NASA, because that's what it um, stands for. And I'd have the expansion text actually describe the whole, the expand NASA um, to the National Aeronaut, what, I forget what it actually stands for all of a sudden. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so basically, uh, all three of these properties are applicable to any node, if you, if the, or can be applicable to any node. You don't have to choose one of these. But there are standard ways of processing them that consumers will do so that if I'm doing content extraction to a textual representation, I'll use the actual text. If I'm reading aloud to a user, I might choose to use the alt. Um, uh, I might use a combination of actual text and the expansion to, uh, depending on what the user wants to do with that content. Um, we already talked a little bit about the concept of artifacts. We, we talked about these, these things on the page that aren't real content. They're artifacts of typography. They could be the soft hyphens or the printer's marks or the background of a table. How do you tell the processor which things are real content and which are not? Well, in PDF 1.7 and PDF UA1, you have to do that explicitly. And the way you do it is by marking stuff that isn't intended to be consumed as content explicitly as an artifact. And so there's another marked content operator called the artifact one, which basically, you see, it doesn't take any properties. It doesn't have a, a dictionary next to it with an MCID. It just says this is an artifact, and this is the content that is an artifact. Uh, it cannot be nested within logical structure. It has to be separate from the logical content. So if you look at the second example where it was nested, that would not be valid PDF. That would be bad tagged PDF. It would be valid PDF syntax, but it would be invalid PDF, uh, tagged PDF, sorry. It also can't, you can't have real content inside an artifact. Once you've declared something an artifact, it, that's all it is. So if you look at the third example, um, that's bad. You've got an artifact that nests real content inside it. Again, that would be invalid tagged PDF. So you have to do the top where you basically <coughs> disambiguate between real content and artifact. <coughs> um, one of the nice things about type PDF is we realize that the standard structure types that I already talked about, those H's and P's and divs and, and documents and such, may be insufficient for people to exchange documents. And people might want to use much more expansive sets of tags. They might want to use something like DocBook or Daisy or, or some other um, tool to exchange documents. And so the way this was provided for in PDF was to basically allow custom tag sets and to role map them to standard types. And so what that means is you can embed any arbitrary custom set of tags you want into a, a tag PDF, but you must map each of those custom tags to one of those standard types through a role map. It's separate, so it's basically, um, you'll see a role map on the right here. You say, if you see the word annotation, just treat it as a span. It's just a demarcation. If you see a heading one, in this case, for some reason, they decided that was a paragraph. They're using it for different purposes. There's no predefined set. One thing that PDF UA disallows is remapping any of the standard types to another standard type. Normal tag PDF does allow that. Um, in PDF 2.0, we've actually tried to make this even more uh, exchangeable and interchangeable by using namespaces. So in PDF 1.7, there's no way to tell someone else what your custom tag set is. You have to assume that they can recognize it from the actual tags. 
In PDF 2.0, we include namespaces, just similar in concept to the XML namespaces. So you can say, this is the MathML custom tag set, so that if another person wants to reuse that, they know what it is, and then they can, uh, they can do it. So if their processor understands your custom tag set, they're welcome to use it. If not, they, have to f they can fall back to the standard types. Um, this is just an example of something that was generated, I think, probably out of uh, InDesign and the, the automatic processing it does to build the role map. Um, it's not very meaningful um, in this case, but it just wanted to show how complex those can get and how um, you know, rich they can be. So tying this all back together very quickly. Um, PDF UA requires tag PDF. That's basically what it, it mandates. And then it has some extra rules about using tag PDF correctly. Um, you know, it, it extends the rules to say, in, in tag PDF, you just say what you think something is. If you tell me it's a paragraph, I'll believe you it's a paragraph. UA says, you've got to be pretty sure it's a paragraph. If that's a table and you've just called it a paragraph, it's badly tagged. Um, uh, it, it, it is fully compatible with tag PDF. We didn't. Um, extend it in any way or change it, but it just puts some restrictions on and requirements. Um, we require some things around headings that I already talked about. The uh, headings have to proceed in logical order. You can't jump levels. Um, there are interactiv interactivity rules and content requirements, but 95% of PDF UA is tag PDF and using it correctly. And that's why it's so important that tag PDF be done well because it's a stepping stone to good PDF UA documents. Um, in PDF 2.0, uh, we've done a little bit of work to clean up tag PDF. Um, we actually did a significant rewrite. Uh, Olaf Drummer uh, from Callus did a great job of, of, of rewriting the chapter. It hasn't changed a lot of fundamentals, but I think it cleaned up and, and uh, clarified some of the confusing parts of the current write-up. So the intent wasn't to change it. The intent was to make it more consumable. However, we did alter the tag set slightly to clean it up. There was some ambi uh, ambiguity as to when to use certain tags and too many tags that no one used and such. And so we cleaned up the core tag set. Um, I already mentioned namespaces, and we've added those as a capability. PDF UA part two, which doesn't exist yet, but we're working on at the moment, will include namespace support. And we'll probably uh, identify a couple of namespaces that have to be recognized. And we also um, actually codified the, the concepts of Heading level seven and above, and MathML as a namespace, and things like that. Um, so, I hope this talk has done a little bit of a job of just kind of clarifying how PDF UA and other things build on top of Tag PDF, and the problems that Tag PDF is trying to solve in PDF content, and how it goes about doing those things. Does anyone have any questions? Or yeah, I'm wondering if the uh, after that API in the future, we provide better support for tag PDF. I mean, as was noted previously, people weren't using it, and it was hard to understand. I mean, that's one way of doing it, for example. And then perhaps also having a, a set of best practices. Because using tag PDF more would solve some problems and deal with some shortcomings of uh, PDF. It would, and I think that's a really good point. I, 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 one thing I will say is that you know, PDF is now an ISO standard, and I was very pleased to see when I looked online for examples just how many people produce and consume PDF beyond Adobe. It's, it's a very well-supported language. Microsoft Word, for example, produces its own tagged PDF directly, not relying on any Adobe APIs and such. So hopefully, th this is something the whole ecosystem has to build. And Adobe would like to be part of that ecosystem, but it, it's not going to drive that ecosystem. It has to be a, a you know a combined effort. Um, it would be nice for for the APIs in Acrobat to be richer along those lines. Uh, completely agreed. Um, and I also think that there's been um, while there are some file formats that work well for producing tag PDF, there's others that don't. For example, at the moment, LaTeX. It's great. It's got good semantics. You want to produce a tag PDF, you'd think it would be really easy. But because of the way it was written, it actually very quickly takes that information and throws it away. It uses it for styling rules, then switch to low level styling and, and laying out of content. So by the time you get to the PDF, it's very hard to put that semantic back in. Um, 
I just can tell you that you can send people for their cookies if you'd like. Okay. okay. Uh, I'll, I'll or you can stay here and keep listening to Matthew. I mean, whatever you Feel free to escape. Um, but basically, um, one of the things that you have to do is authoring software has to get in there early while it still has that semantic information, while it still has the, the rich information that will allow you to produce good tag PDF. Because if you try to do it after the fact, it's really hard. If, if you try to apply this when you've already laid it out and done all the work, it's, it's an uphill battle versus if you do it when you're laying out the content, you, you, de you demarcate your content stream as you write the content stream. It's so much easier than to build that into a tagged model. It's not impossible to do it after the fact. I mean, many people have. But getting in there early with the software, having the software understand the semantics is key to good tag PDF generation. Any other questions? Uh, do people want cookies? Is there any way of identifying just from the file if it's tagged or not? Yes. And so, um, the, actually, there's several things you can do. So if we forget PDF UA completely, um, a tagged PDF will have um, a key in it. And I feel this in the catalog, I think it's in the strip tree root, that says marked true. And if it, if, it, if it says that, it's a tagged PDF. The presence of a strict tree root actually is a, a pretty strong hint that it's, it's, it's tagged. But that marked operator tells you that it's supposed to be tagged. Um, PDF UA goes beyond that. In, in the XMP metadata stream, actually has a way of identifying that it's a, a PDF UA compliant, claims to be a PDF UA compliant document. It doesn't guarantee it because you could lie. Um, but if you see that flag in the metadata stream, again, you, you not only know it's tagged, but really well tagged, hopefully. Sounds like cookies are available. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.